said that of all people that would probably have a reason to denounce the Christ, you know, Christianity because they, they rejected Christ as the Messiah, right? They think that he wasn't sure. the Messiah that they were waiting for. And so it would make sense to me, at least superficially, and please you know, dive into that, be, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems superficially if he was just a myth that the Jews would be around a long time ago and this person never existed. This is a complete fabrication. But we don't see that, do yeah. we? No, we don't. And, and that's what I was referring to before when I was saying that one of the places we might, might expect to find references to, uh, to either, either to this proto-Christian mythicist form of Christianity that mythicism requires or to the, or to the idea that, that Jesus just didn't exist is in, in the Jewish criticisms of, mm -hmm. of Christianity, of which we, we do have some references. Um, now, the Jewish criticisms of Christianity are that Jesus wasn't the Messiah, um, that he was a fraud, that he was a magician, that he was a liar, right. that he was a charlatan, but none of them say he didn't exist. Now, of course, the yeah, that's a, that's a huge that difference, well, though. Yeah, counter-argument to that is, well, they didn't start countering Christianity until it became big enough for them to bother. And by that stage, um, uh, no one, everyone had forgotten that Jesus hadn't existed. So, you know, maybe. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's, an, it's another kind of gap in the evidence that kind of makes you think that this, this whole idea that he never existed would be a bit of a, uh, is a bit of, has a bit, a, a bit of a problem at its core. But our, just, just thinking about our, our first century Jewish peasant in Galilee, what was going on in this period was people were asking that question, why is life so hard? Why am I oppressed when I'm meant to be the chosen, part of the chosen people of God living in God's promised land? Why is God allowing this to happen? And there were a number of answers to that question that developed. Now, one of the traditional answers has, had always been, and we find this in the Old Testament, the various prophets popping up and saying, God is oppressing you by allowing you to be conquered by the Assyrians, the Persians, the Babylonians, and whatever, because you haven't, you, you've turned away from God. So what you need to do is you need to live the, the Jewish religion more purely, and God will will uh, will respond by smiting the oppressors. So we find that all the time through the Old Testament. That argument was starting to wear a bit thin, though, by the first century AD, because it didn't seem as though that was making a whole lot of difference. Some people were responding to it by going out into the desert and living um, very, very holy individual lives, so Josephus, for example, was the student of a guy called Banus, and Banus was a hermit who lived out in the desert, uh, lived off the land, and spent most of his time dousing himself in cold water to fend off lust. Um, there seemed to be a few of those guys. But that was a fairly radical thing and a bit difficult for our peasant to do. Um, there were other people who went and formed communities out in the desert that were supposedly sort of perfect communities. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least some of them, seem to have been written by uh, sects such as the Essenes who, who went out to the desert and, and formed kind of a perfect Jewish kingdom out on their own. And, and that seemed to be another response. But one of the responses was that what was going on was God had withdrawn his power from the world and but one day was going to come back and was going to reassert his authority. And this was because Judaism in the period between the last book of the Old Testament, the last book to be written, which is probably the book of Daniel, and the what we call the, the New Testament, so this period that's called the intertestamental period, Judaism underwent some radical change. So the Judaism that we see reflected in the Old Testament became quite different by the time we get to our Jewish peasant in the early first century AD. And some of the things that had changed was that the whole conception of the universe had changed. It had been heavily influenced by uh, Persian religion, particularly Zoroastrianism and also by Greek philosophy. So the Persian influence meant that they now believe that there was a war going on in the cosmos. There was a war going on between the forces of good, led by God and his angels, and the forces of evil, led by Satan and the demons. Now, if you've ever had a look at the Old Testament, if anyone's actually bothered to slog their way through it, Satan doesn't appear very often. When he does appear, he appears largely as a kind of a servant of God who goes around testing people, like in the book of Job. But by the time we get to our first century peasant, Satan has become the bad guy in this cosmic war. And this is all coming from the Zoroastrian religion. They, they believe that there was a good god, Ahura Mazda, and a bad god, uh, Ahriman, and there was a cosmic war going on between the two. This influenced Judaism. 
So the Judaism came to believe, or many Jews came to believe that there was a cosmic war going on. And what was happening was that God had withdrawn his power from the world, mostly, and Abiman, or sorry, Satan and his demons were pretty much in control. They were in they were the lords of the world. This is why the bad guys were were winning. And this was their answer to the question of why do bad things keep happening to me? Um, the other influence they had was from ancient Greek philosophy, you know, particularly Platonic philosophy, believed that um, that the material world was a kind of a dim reflection of a cosmic ideal. And so they believed that the material world was reflecting what was going on out in the cosmos. And so because there was a battle between Satan and God, demons and angels, that was being reflected on Earth. And what was going to happen was God was going to intervene. God was going to come back and reimpose his rule on the Earth. This got caught up with another idea that one day a descendant of King David was going to come up was going to arise and was going to sweep away all the bad guys. So the kings of ancient Israel were anointed with oil as their sign of their of their um, their favoured status by God. So they were often referred to as Masiach, meaning anointed ones, from which we get the word Messiah. So there was this increasing idea that the Messiah was coming. A Messiah was coming, and when would the Messiah come? When God reasserts his rule his kingship in the world. So there was this idea for our, our first century peasant that things are going to get better. When God reasserts himself, when the Messiah arises, God will come down from heaven with armies of angels. He will sweep away all the bad guys. He will punish all the bad people. He will cleanse the earth. The Messiah will then judge not just the living, but also the dead, because everyone who has, has died already will be raised from the dead in a general resurrection. And God will judge everyone. And from that point on, the righteous will live in the kingdom of God and the unrighteous will be cast out into the fires of hell. Now, is any of this sounding slightly familiar? Yeah. So we find all this, yeah, in the, we tend to find all this in the Gospels. So if you, if you think about our first century peasant, if he is having a hard time making ends meet, if he's really uh, struggling to to feed his family, and if he's not happy about the fact that he has to pay these massive taxes to King Herod Agrippa, who he doesn't even regard as a proper Jew, the Herods were Jews, but they were Edomians, so they were fairly recent converts and weren't considered proper Jews by, by people like our peasant. If you weren't happy about this, and then someone turned up in your village saying, I've got good news, the kingship of God, the reassertion of God's power on earth is coming not one day, but coming soon. The kingdom of God is so close you can almost touch it. Repent and believe, and you'll be amongst the saved when the kingdom comes because it's coming soon. If you heard that and you were our, our, our first century peasant, you'd probably listen to that guy. You'd probably listen to the, the, him saying that, that everything was going to get better, not just one day, soon. And if we then turn to the earliest of the material in the New Testament. We find someone saying exactly that. So just to look at a couple of, of bits from the, the Gospels, um, what we find in the Gospels is the very first thing that Jesus is reported as saying, doesn't mean he definitely said this, the very first thing that he is reported as saying in the earliest Gospel, so Mark 1.15, these are the first words depicted as coming out of Jesus' mouth. The time is fulfilled and the kingship of God has drawn near. Repent and believe in this good news. This is exactly the kind of message that we're finding in all of this intertestamental stuff about a coming apocalypse. The time is fulfilled. He's saying it's coming now. The apocalypse is coming now. God is descending very soon with his armies of angels, his rivers of fire. He's going to sweep all the bad guys away. Everything's going to get better, guys. This is good news. Mm -hmm. The Greek word for good news is evangelion. Um, the English translation of evangelion is gospel. So when it's all the bits in the, in the gospels about you know, believing in the gospel, what's the gospel? The gospel is evangelion. The gospel is this good news. The apocalypse is coming. It's coming soon. And if you repent, you'll be on the right side 
of the battle that's coming between God and his angels and Satan and his demons. This is what and that's the very narr- that's, is talking about. That's been the narrative for the last 2,000 years. Yeah, it is. But the interesting thing is that when we look at the, the early Gospels, this is very much all of Jesus' teaching. This is, they, they, they don't, they don't, everything else that he says is, is actually focused on this. Once you understand that context, suddenly the Gospels cease to be about gentle Jesus, meek and mild, patting lambs and telling everyone to be nice to each other. It becomes actually about a Jewish apocalyptic preacher preaching that the end of the world was coming probably in his lifetime, if not in his lifetime, then very soon afterwards. Because he, 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 he tells us, he, you know, in, in, uh, he's depicted as telling the people he was listening, he was listening to him. He says um, in Mark 13, he basically gives a little apocalyptic speech. Uh, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it doesn't belong, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from the sky. And at that time, people will see the Son of Man, the Messiah, coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels, gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth and to the ends of the heavens. So here he is talking about the apocalypse coming. But the interesting bit about it is he says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, then there's a little note saying, let the reader understand. This is in the Gospel of Mark. Mark seems to have been written just after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the, the first Jewish war in 70 AD. The abomination of that, that, uh, that um, causes desolation is a reference to the book of Daniel. But when he says, let the le- reader understand, he's saying, when you see pagans sacrificing to idols in the temple, then the apocalypse will be coming very soon afterwards. And we know that when the Romans, yeah, and and we know that when the Romans, uh, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, just before they started tearing down the temple, the first thing they did as a big fuck you to the Jews is they set up their standards, which they worshipped as gods, and sacrificed in front of them. So this is the writer of the Gospel of Mark putting these words in the mouth of Jesus. But effectively, what he's saying is, we've seen this shit. It happened not long ago. So what Jesus was saying is it's hap- this, this apocalypse is coming in our lifetimes. It's coming very, very soon. And, and, I, and I think that's kind of a good place to leave it, though. Um, We've we got to start wrapping it up here, Tim. So uh, we're going to do some Sorry, super man. chats, but do you want to finish, finish that thought? i I got to interview sometime because we're really getting close on time. Um, do you want to wrap up that thought or do you just want to go into the super chats? Well, I think the, the, the key thing is that, the, um, uh, that this is the stuff that you find in the earliest, uh, earliest Gospels. What you find in the later Gospels is this stuff gets played down and eventually it gets removed completely. So by the time you get to the Gospel of John, this this stuff all disappears. All the apocalypse stuff disappears. The message becomes Hmm. about Jesus as saviour. So what this means is it is most likely that the reason you get this apocalyptic stuff in the beginnings, in the earlier stuff, and it gets played down later on, is that this is the kind of thing, whether it was exactly these words, that the historical Jesus was actually saying. And it, it gets remembered, but then as, as the predictions about the apocalypse coming don't come true, it gets changed. That makes sense. what apocalyptic sex always do. Uh, you know what? I think there's a lot of um, verticality in that. That makes a lot of sense to me, matter of fact, that it, early on it would have been more <laughs> apocalyptic. And then as the things didn't come true, they became more of a savior type thing. And, you know, uh, the, the more extreme things. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. Uh, so let me see. Let me say this real quick, Steve. Yes, Kyle. Well, yes, Kyle. Steve. Yes, um, I just want to say to address. Uh, I have been trying to keep up with the um, the live chat and you at the same time, Tim. But it was proving rather difficult. Um, I must say, I by some, I'm I'm quite shocked and a little disappointed. Um, the I knew this was going to be contentious. Um, however, I thought we would be able to handle it as a collective a lot differently. And we've had Richard Carrier on here twice. And the way that we did those was we let him um, state his case. Stephen, I don't know very much about this topic. It would be uh, pointless for us to try to get involved. So what we decided to do, we we would let them present their case, Uh, Dr. Carrier presenting his, and then we brought Tim on to present his. Um, Where I find the, the, the frustrating part is that this 
kind of outcry of um, 